Hi, I'm DJ Ware, and today I'd like to talk about something called Plan 9 from Belt Labs. So we'll get to that right after this. Plan 9 from Bell Labs it was a project that was started by Rob Pike, Ken Thompson, and Dennis Ritchie, along with Dave Presoto, Sean Dorwood, Bob Flanderina, uh, Howard Trickery, and Phil Winterbottom at the AT&T Bell Lab. Their motivation was twofold, and that was to build an operating system that would fit an increasingly distributed world. And they wanted to do so in a clean and elegant manner. And the plan was not to build it directly on Unix, and, but the attempt to build a new design from scratch, which they call Plan 9 from Bell Labs. That was an inside joke uh, inspired by Ed Wood's cult B movie called Plan 9 from Outer Space. It is safe to state that the grandchildren of some of the people in this theater will not be born on Earth. Calling it a, 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 a B-movie is probably being kind. Plan 9 is built around a radically different model from that of a conventional operating system. The OS is structured as a collection of loosely coupled services that can be hosted on different machines. Now, if you contrast that with Unix or even Linux, those are considered monolithic designs simply because they're all-encompassing. Everything is there, the operating system, the network, the file system, and the user. So, all and the namespace for all of those things. Unix, by the way, only had one namespace uh, for the entire machine. You couldn't break it up. So another key concept is, of the design is a per-process namespace that corrected this problem of one namespace. Each process could either have multiple processes in the namespace or a single one in a namespace. But those could be mapped onto local uh, names that were fixed by convention so that programs using those servers didn't need to change if the current service was replicated by others that were providing the same functionality. In other words, no matter which namespace it ran in, I didn't have to change the program to do that. It, was a, it, it would take care of it all in itself. But despite all these groundbreaking innovations in Plan 9, the operating system never took off, at least not well enough to justify Bell Labs' continuing investment in Plan 9. And so those innovations found their ways into many commercial operating systems, including Linux, uh, and the concept of making operation uh, OS services via the file system that's now pervasive in Linux. So... You could think uh, Plan 9 gave us that gift over here in Linux. Plan 9 is still around. It's not being actively developed as far as I know, but uh, it is available now as open source. It is uh, under the MIT license. And there have been a number of spinoffs from that, and we'll go through those at the end. But Plan 9 is a minimalist windowing system design that's been replicated many times. For example... The UTF-8 character encoding that's used universally today in browsers, that was first invented and implemented in Plan 9. The design of Plan 9 anticipated today's microservices architectures by more than a decade. Uh, even though they didn't have the concept of a thin process, uh, and there were some reasons for that, but but they yeah, but they did def they did define the tenets of a microservices architecture. The trend in the late that they saw in the late '80s was to move from large centralized time sharing computers towards networks of smaller, cheaper personal machines. Some of them were based on Unix. Some were based on on uh, Mac OS. Some of them were built on Windows. But it was clear that there were some problems uh, in rushing to personal workstations, particularly those that were based on Unix. All of a sudden, the weaknesses that Unix had operating in this environment started to bubble up and become problems for administrators to try to solve. So we'll talk about what those are. 
Unix is an old time sharing system. It, it just wasn't designed for workstation workloads in mind. Why? What was the motivation? So the problem with Unix was is that graphics and networking were add-ons. They weren't there when Unix was initially designed, and so they weren't integrated in at the kernel level correctly. They were bolted on onto the outside, like X Windows. X Windows runs as a user process outside of the kernel. Uh, their, their networking did originally as well. Now today, some of that functionality, particularly with the, the NICs and the devices and so forth, have moved into the kernel. But there are still a great deal of the networking that's still done outside of the kernel. So, there, And that was because of the legacy of it not being designed that way to begin with. The focus was on private machine uh, each each person having their own copy of uh, of a machine made it difficult for those networks of machines to serve seamlessly as a time sharing system could because they they had to figure out ways what to share how to share it uh, how to get a personalized space for a user that would remain uh, private and so that other people couldn't access work that they were doing. Beginning in the late 1980s, there was an attempt to have it have this both ways. So what does that mean? Well, we wanted to build a system from inexpensive microcomputer systems, and yet we still wanted to have central administration. And that would allow us to put together resources that users could share, like printers and tape drives and disks, and at the same time, would allow them to have uh, uh, control over their own namespaces as to which services they needed and wanted and could get access to. The problems with Unix were too deep to fix. It was inherently flawed for this kind of a purpose. However, some of the ideas of Unix could be reused, like the file system, that could coordinate naming of and access to resources and even devices. Now, the first to be designed in this whole thing that they needed was a protocol. They invented something called 9P, which is their network protocol. It works with TCP IP. Uh, it, it also works with a number of other uh, protocols for um, telecommunication services. But its primary purpose was to be uh, the communications protocol between all of the different pieces and components in a Plan 9 system. So that other thing that 9P did was it allowed people to customize their computer agents to provide customized views of resources in the network. So I didn't have to give them all, all access to every server in the network or every file system in the network. I could give them a view of it. And not only could I give them a view of it, I could also define those views based on the processes they were running. So certain processes may require file systems on this particular system, but not these others. Or it may require access to files on this particular system, but not the other files on that system. So there were really three principles here that this whole thing was built on. Resources are named and access like files in a hierarchical file system. Resources being any kind of device. The other one was standard protocols like 9P are accessing these resources and bringing them together and making them look like a cohesive single view. The, the third one was disjoint hierarchies are provided by different services are joined together at the private hierarchical file namespace that the user built initially when they logged on. So each user could have their own copy of the file systems adjoined to their private space on their terminal. To do that, they had CPU servers, and those provided computational services for Plan 9. They did things like compilation, text processing, serving applications, but they didn't have any local file storage. So where did that come from? That came from the file servers. Those held all the permanent files. So the file server presents a file system to the client, not just as an array of disks or blocks or files, but just as here's the file systems that you need. So here's all the stuff you need when you sign on. And those can be addressed for I.O. at the byte level. So the file stores would operate over high-speed data links rather than 
uh, and those and rather than some uh, conventional Ethernet environment, they they were meant to work over very high speed network. Generally speaking, a file server communication networks are faster than the individual disk transfer speed. That way, the bottleneck isn't the network. The bottleneck is the drive, is the actual disk device itself. And that's basically where you want it, right? Uh, so the terminals uh, in Plan 9, now don't think of these as green screen text-only terminals or not. The terminal in Plan 9 was called a NOT, G-N-O-T. And you could think of these sort of as diskless workstations that would provide a graphical display, had a mouse and a keyboard, but terminals didn't contain any local storage and there was no way to add it. There, there was no expansion bus on those machines at all. So that's the difference between why they call them a terminal and not a workstation. Workstations would have local file storage. They would have compute capability that was pretty massive on those uh, versus a terminal would have compute capability of a limited form, but they were really designed to submit the jobs back to a compute server. Uh, the namespaces, there was two kinds that were supplied in Plan 9. First was the global namespace. Basically, that contained things like the, the, the names of the servers on the network. So uh, Also, they had a local namespace. That contains the local space of files and servers that were available to a process. The communications protocol with Plan 9 is file-oriented. All services, whether they're local or remote, are arranged in file-like objects, and those are collected into a hierarchy called the namespace of the server. All right, let's walk through this. So let's say a user logs into their terminal. The first thing they have to do is they have to tell it which particular file server they're, they're directing that, that login request to, because that becomes their home server, basically, for their file system. So the terminal then calls, uh, it, it then authenticates that user, and then it downloads the operating system to the terminal, which the terminal starts to execute. And that would then initiate uh, reading the profile from their personal directory on the file server. And that profile contains commands that define what services are to be used by default. So there's a group of, of default ones that the user can save off. So if they're needing, you know, all these different things, they can put them in the profile, and then every time they log in, it all gets rebuilt for them automatically. From a security, there's there's a lot more to this. I'm not I'm not going to jump. I mean, if I did, we'd be here for six hours. What I would suggest you do if you want to learn more about this, I'll I'll talk about a few more things. But uh, if you want to learn more about how Plan Nine worked there. There's some really great documentation that's on their website for, and I'll put a link below to the Plan 9 Foundation, which has not only the documentation, but they also have the source code and the binaries uh, if you want to run it. There is also a version that was put together third party some years ago that runs on any, if you have a um, Raspberry Pi 3 or an above, that will run on a Raspberry Pi. So if you want to do that, you can you can go uh, play with that on a Raspberry Pi rather than having to put it up on a virtual machine or anything like that. Security. So the file servers can only serve files. They can't execute applications. So right there, I don't have any way to infiltrate the file servers and run code on them because they're not capable of running code, nor will they allow it. Uh, the CPU servers do allow running code, uh, do allow running code, but they don't have any file servers, any files uh, attached to them. So yeah, that, it's going to be kind of difficult. And the interface by which the CPU and the file services communicate, that's controlled, and it doesn't have any special privileges. So uh, you're only going to get what that user had access to. You can't jump outside of that. And, and gain access to any of the privileged areas of the system. Yes, you do have administrative control that does have privileged access, but you can only do that from the council. That's all I had for today. I hope you uh, hope you enjoyed this talk on Plan 9. Uh, and and uh, if you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again real soon, and bye for now.